Hey, my name is PK, and you're listening to the MBS Show. Hello, and welcome to a special episode of the MBS Show. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Charlie. Hello, everybody. Hey, Charlie, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you, Norman? Fine, thank you. Fine, thank you. I could have, I could use a drink, but hey, it's not that time of the day yet. <laughs> not you. <laughs> so anyway, Charlie, I think you hunt down these guests, right? Oh yeah, um, for quite a while now, but I actually never got the time to schedule properly because of busy work schedules and real life stuff. <laughs> okay. Anyway, I think everybody's dying to find out who is the special guest we have, and introducing our special guest all the way from the states. Like there's any other place else. Um, it's PK from EQD. Hi, everybody. Hey, PK, how are you doing? I'm doing pretty well. Pretty tired because it's uh, after midnight here, and I just finished working. But I'll be all right. Oh, okay, okay. Like finishing work, nine hour shift, right? Yeah, nine hours. It was pretty rough. Okay, okay, okay. We will try not to keep you up too late. But yeah, it's all right. Before we. St- Start with the normal interview session of this show. I need to ask you the four basic questions. Question number one is: Who is your favorite character? Twilight Sparkle. Oh, book smart pony. Um, <laughs> yeah, purple smart. <laughs> any reason why? I just think she's the most adorable. Uh, she's the most fun for me to watch. So uh, maybe no. adorable would be a correct term. <laughs> adorable. Yeah, that'd be the the more accurate term. Okay, I I can see the appeal. Here's the question I like to ask all those Twilight Sparkle fans: What do you think of Princess Alec on Twilight Sparkle? Oh, good one, good one. Well, I kind of like from the beginning of the show. I kind of figured that that was gonna be where she ended up. I was like, you know, oh, she has a name that is the time of day, just like Celestia and Luna. And I just kind of figured, you know, eh, she's probably gonna end up in Alicorn. But I will say, I thought it was gonna be the series finale and not. <laughs> in the middle of the show, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes from here. Okay, okay, that's going to be interesting, that's going to be interesting. So, question number two is, what is your favorite episode? My favorite episode is probably Party of One, but Lesson Zero is hot on its heels. Oh, oh we have good choices, we have similar tastes, good minds think alike. So, um, <laughs> okay, so party, is, party of One is at the top of your list, and Lesson Zero is catching up? Mm-hmm, it's pretty close. So, uh, Party of One, why that episode? Uh, a lot of reasons. I think uh, probably nostalgia goggles for season one, because I was, I was in the fandom way back then when season one was happening, and uh, I remember that episode just being a really fun one when it came out. And uh, it's just really fun to see uh, Pinkie Pie... Uh, not being her usual bubbly self and instead being completely psychotic. Uh, it's, it's just a really fun episode, some really great jokes, and some great character moments. I just think it's a really strong one. Okay, and why Lesson Zero? One of my favorite episodes is Lesson Zero, so um, just wondering, why Lesson Zero? Lesson Zero, uh, again, because it's just really fun. To see Twilight go completely out of her mind over something completely trivial because I know people like that in real life who like, like they have like 110% in the class, but if they have one assignment late, they immediately begin like unraveling their entire life. (laughs) And it's, it's just, it's, it's so true. And it's really fun to watch, uh, everything escalate and Twilight lose her grasp on sanity more and more. But, uh, okay, I have this question I want to ask. It's about EQD, and do Kelpin and Seth do that? I would say that, yes, that would be an accurate representation of the inner workings of EQD. <laughs> okay, 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 then. So we know backstory about how EQD works. It's, it's very relatable. The episodes really relate to the current situation in real life. <laughs> Okay, then. So question number three is, how did you become a fan of the show? Well, basically, it's a pretty uh, usual story. I just saw it everywhere. You know, I think the first thing I saw was I saw a GIF of it on uh, 4chan, and then it just started popping up every place that I visited, like all my online habitations. So eventually I decided to give it a shot, and I watched like one episode of it like way back in December 2010. I watched an episode, and I was I was like, oh, yeah. But then in uh, January 2011, I decided that I should really just sit through and watch all the show up to 
the current point to see what all the fuss was about. And after like the second episode, I was hooked, <laughs> and the rest is history. I think the first episode I saw on TV was Sonic Rainboom. <laughs> so that should give you an idea of how long I've been uh, around. Wow. That that that's have to say that you're really old school with this. <laughs> December is like only two months after the the first episode premiere, if I'm not mistaken, October 2010. Yeah. So the last question is: What do your family and friends think about your love for the show? My family is just kind of bemused. They don't really get it, but they're just like, okay, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, and uh, my friends. A lot of them were pretty much the same way, but I've slowly started to convert them, and I've actually got a lot of my circle of friends now watch the show. So oh, it's pretty great! Uh, it's, a, it's quite an achievement right there, actually. So basically, they will be assimilated. Mm-hmm. <laughs> awesome, awesome! Assimilation stories are fun. Yeah, they join the herd. Indeed. <laughs> And, well, basically, those are my four basic questions. Um, thank you for answering them, PK. So, moving on to the next topic is guest time. And we have PK. He just introduced himself just a few seconds ago, but I'm just going to ask him again. How are you doing, PK? Are you having fun yet? <laughs> yes, I am immensely enjoying myself. <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay, uh, so, am I introducing yourself to the people who not know who you are or what you do? All right. Well, uh, my name is PK. The first question I'm sure it's going to come to everyone's mind is, what does PK stand for? To which I must answer, boringly, nothing. I just thought it sounded cool. And um, I made the username when I was about 10, and I'd been playing, like, Super Smash Brothers Melee, and I'd been playing as Ness, and so, you know, PK Fire! <laughs> I, I actually went back and played Earthbound a couple years later, and it's amazing. But um, that's where the username came from. So... That's about it. And then what I do is I am Equestria Daily's uh, intern for life, which uh, <laughs> that's my that's my title. And I also wrote Antipodes, which became a fairly popular uh, fanfic. And I'm working on its sequel right now, Lodestone. Ah, oh, cool, cool. Oh, so now I know how to properly pronounce that word. <laughs> yeah, no, I actually mispronounced it for like six months. <laughs> like... I was saying antipodes because, all right, so the plural of, or no, the, the uh, like the adjective form is like antipodian, and the singular of the word is antipode, and then you add an S to it and it becomes antipodes, <laughs> and so I don't think I can be blamed for mispronouncing it, but yeah, it took me a long, long time. Someone actually had to pull out a dictionary and show it to me before I would change my pronunciation of it. <laughs> antipodes, okay. Cool. Okay. Wow, bringing out the big guns with the dictionary, eh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, PK. That, that was an interesting story. So it's Antipodes, not Antipode? <laughs> yeah, it's Antipodes. Okay, so Antipodes. I, I need to remember that. We we podcasters need to stay smart, or sound smart at least. <laughs> well, don't feel bad because I mispronounced it and so did like <laughs> many, many other people for a long time. It's a weird word. It's an obscure word. True, true. Anyway, um, I'll give this section to Charlie. Charlie, why don't you take over? All right, sure thing. I'll hand her up the um, guest time for this uh, show, for this section. All right, PK. Um, so now, if you, now they've got the introduction out of the way, you've actually done quite a significant uh, amount of work in the Question Daily, number one pony news site all over the internet. So, um, would you care to tell us how how did that come about? Like how it started and up and so far? Well. Basically, when I submitted Antipodes to Equestria Daily, it was in March of 2011, and um, this was before we had pre-readers, this was before, you know, like half the crew, this was way back in the olden days, and uh, Serial, Serial Velocity, uh, another Equestria Daily staffer, was the only one basically reading fanfics along with Seth to determine their quality, and it was much laxer, and so... He pre-read my fic, and it got up on the site. And after that, I started bugging Seth all the time to fix little, like, spacing errors or to update the post, you know, and uh, to get... I just bugged him so much that eventually we started talking and became friends. (laughs) And then I started talking to Serial, and we became friends too. And then that just sort of went on 
for a long time until one day uh, Seth was like, I don't want to do a nightly roundup. Hey, PK, why don't you do it? And I was like, okay. And then from that point on, I was kind of in. Uh huh. That's basically how it went down. So when you got in, you were given quite an interesting title, which you mentioned earlier. Is it something about being stuck in the closet and such? <laughs> well, the uh, the whole closet thing uh, started out as in 2012, I believe, uh-huh. yeah. Uh, 2012, I was doing nightly roundups. I was told to do nightly roundups for five months in exchange five for months. airfare. Yeah, <laughs> in exchange for airfare to BronyCon. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Uh, yeah, it was a pretty sweet deal. Um, Seth was super great for doing that for me, but, uh, so that was, that was the deal. And after a while, you can only do so many nightly roundups before you start getting a little bit bored of them. (laughs) (laughs) So I started sort of constructing this little narrative inside (laughs) of the roundups where, uh, it started off really subtly. I was just kind of implying that, um, Equestria Daily was actually this giant, like industrial complex I like Aperture Science, where everything, anything and everything was out to kill me, and I was just sort of trapped in there as a science experiment who had somehow gained access to a computer and was uh, making unauthorized posts, and it just kind of grew from there, and it's sort of the thing that everyone remembers about my time doing nightly roundups, which I'm really happy about, but that's basically how all that got started. Oh. Yeah, myself included. That's how I actually got to take note of your involvement, your shenanigans in UQD. <laughs> so I, I got a question here. So when you did all that, was this before Serial did his whole thing with the his YouTube page? Uh, no, Serial's YouTube was out before I started. Uh, I don't remember exactly how long before, but he definitely came first. Oh, so you didn't you didn't influence him to do what he does now because what he's doing is somehow kind of involved with your storyline because I. I I feel like Equestrian Innovations, which is what Serial does, sort of tied into my story really nicely. And I think now that they've sort of intertwined, like I, I help Serial out a lot on his Equestrian Innovations videos, or a lot as in I help him make jokes sometimes. Um, I, he does all of the editing and all the actual hard work and most of 99% of the writing, but uh, I do help him out a little bit at least. So I think there probably is some mix there oh okay okay you so you do the important part the funny part <laughs> uh, he does most of the funny parts it's just every now and then he'll be like does this joke work and i'll be like yes or no you should make this joke instead and okay. that's basically how it does no it's just it sounded so familiar did, did, did you got his did he got inspired by you or was he like, it sounds so it works out well perfectly it works perfectly it's i think it's just good luck yeah, and I think also it has got to be Portal that actually brought you guys like having the same mindset, right? I mean, come on, Aperture Science, Dystopian Laboratory being trapped. <laughs> yeah. It's all Portal references. It, it Basically, I think we both kind of wanted to make Portal references. Like, I think Serial's tried to do more of his own thing as the uh, Equestrian Innovations has progressed, like, instead of just, you know, straight up Cave Johnson here. But uh, I think that because we both were influenced by Portal when we started doing this. It, it allowed us to sort of tie them together really well. Yes. And make, make it a more consistent Equestria Daily dystopian universe. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. That's great. Uh, Norman, you've got, you've got something else you want to ask? Um, I got one. Um, how many pre-readers are there in the group? There are a lot. According to Skype, we have a little room with like all the pre-readers or most of them, and there's 42 people in there, but some of those are not pre-readers, and some of them are blog authors, and a whole bunch of them don't ever say or do anything. (laughs) So the actual amount that are active in pre-reading is probably more like 10 or 15, and a lot of them stick around and chat, but don't do much in the way of pre-reading. So it's a very fluid number. It's very difficult to pin down. Oh, because um, way back when, we had this one guy... He's called Chromosome, and he's a pre-reader for you guys. Mm-hmm. And yeah, he, Chrome's still around. Yeah, and he said that um, things happen like this in EQD. Um, here, how the pre-reader works. He's not sure about how the pre-listener works. But yeah, it sounds interesting. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, actually, regarding this pre-reader system, it's a very uh, evolving system, if I'm not mistaken. Because I remember uh, you guys were trying to fine-tune the system so that you get the most amount of coverage and make sure that it's done in a way that it's uh, fair for most people and all that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's definitely a balancing act because we get a lot of stories submitted to us and um, we want to make sure that the stuff that is posted on Equestria Daily is the cream of the crop, mm-hmm. you know? Like, we want the best stuff to go up on the site, and but we also want to uh, help out authors that may not quite be there yet. Yeah. Yeah. But it's sometimes hard to do that because of the sheer volume of the stories that get submitted. It's hard to give everyone else their own, you know, individual review. Mm-hmm. So the, we have you know, a system that's set up to try and do as much as we can without making everybody angry, you know, by not giving their story a fair shot or going too far in the other direction and becoming a free editing service, which would mean that, you know, we'd take a million years to do anything. Yeah, I I heard the pre-readers list is really long. It's really long. I recently heard how far they were backed up, like how long their queue was. And I don't think that I should repeat it on the air, but it's pretty far, and not through no fault of their own. It's just the number of stories we get through we get submitted is astronomical. Yeah, true. Just imagine one day you get one person submitting, and then that one person times ten times ten. Mm. Then oh god, uh, I can just imagine you. You guys are really busy, and if you want to get your fanfic notice, where else but EQD? Exactly. Well, I think uh, a lot of people now are starting to just submit to film fiction, which is great, but uh, I, I hope people will still consider submitting to Equestria Daily. But one thing I'm really proud about that we only just recently got doing, got, by, got done, is we removed the no fanfic button from huh? Equestria Daily, which was something that I think has not been necessary for a long time, because like way back in the day, when we used to just sort of post every story we got sent that was uh, you know appropriate, mm-hmm. um, we would be inundated with fanfics. You know, there'd be like tons going up every day. But now that we're being a lot more selective, that hasn't been the case. And I feel like having a button that just kind of allows people to ignore fanfiction has meant that fanfiction hasn't really gotten the fair exposure that it should. Just because some people clicked the button back in like June 2011 and, and never took it off. You know what? With that said, I think I, I, I want to be responsible for that happening because Chromosome said that he wants that button removed. And I kind of agreed, and somehow the revolution came in, and Seth got pressured into doing it. So no more fanfic button is gone. It's everyone's victory. Yay! I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Equestria Daily was like one of the first blog for all the pony material that uh, was ever out there. Am I correct? So I, I don't know if it was the first. But it was definitely one of the first. Of the I first. think I think the better way to say it is one of the first uh, MLP FIM uh, blogs out there. Ah, uh, right, of course, of course, Generation Four blogs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 that's yeah. But it, well, I mean, I don't, I don't even know if it was the first uh, Friendship is Magic blog. I think I, I don't know, and I'm sure I'll get eaten alive if I'm wrong. But I think. Derpy Hoots news actually came a little bit before we did. Mm. But I don't know that for a fact. But In you, fact, you might want to not air that. <laughs> you know what? Let, I don't know if I'm right, and if I'm wrong, that would be very bad. Hey, you know what? Let's just do this. Um, if it's not the first, it's the most well-known. Hey, uh, like our yes, show. that's fair. Yeah. Okay. okay, then how about FinFig? I I'm, I'm think that came later, and then uh, people started submitting to FinFig once it has gotten a, a, a regular user base. And therefore, that's why the EQD section of fanfics actually slowed down because people are actually moving to uh, fanfic. Do you think? I, think I, I definitely think that's true. Mm. Um, fan fiction is a really, it's a really great community for writers. It's just really easy to post your stories. It's really easy to get exposure. You know, there's a lot of people on there, a lot of really talented people there. Mm. I'm very proud that I was one of the earliest adopters of film fiction. I uploaded Antipodes on the first day it went up, like oh, wow. the first day the site went up. And I have a story ID, like the, they number all the stories that go up. Huh? Uh-huh. I have an ID of 20. Woo-hoo. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. And the newest story is 120,360. Wow. So, oh, wow. Yeah. 
I got in pretty early. But um, I think Confiction is a great community. The guy that runs it, Nighty, is a personal friend of mine, and he works so hard every day to make sure the site is uh, as good as it can be. So the fact that fan fiction is slowed down on Equestria Daily, I think is kind of an unfortunate side effect of the fact that fan fiction is just a really... Like, I don't think it's... I think a lot of people think, you know, oh, we don't need to submit to Equestria Daily if we can get exposure on fan fiction. But, you know, I think that Equestria Daily still is a place to spotlight, you know, the, yeah. the best stories in the fandom for people that may not want yeah, to be I, I think... as immersed in fan fiction as a fan fiction account might make you. I think sure that he started it, so it's still uh, sort of like the premier site, uh, um, the, the site that started it all. So, of course, it still has to amount to something. Right, yeah, but the like the, I... the number of stories we get submitted should hopefully prove that uh, people still want their stories on Equestria Daily and that you still get a good traffic bump from it. Yeah, uh, and I... you have to add to the fact that the fandom actually is ever-growing. It, it just grows to such... Uh, such a large level and in so little amount of time. Oh my god, it's insane. You, you can't keep up I, with everything. Yeah, well, like I remember when I first joined the fandom, hipster warning, but when I first joined the fandom, I remember there was probably less than 100 people. You knew most people by name. It was it was crazy. Like in the entire fandom, which was relegated to like one thread on 4chan's comics board at any given time. Like that was the fandom. That was oh, it. Wow. It was, wow. yeah, and now it's huge, and it's spanning the entire world, and it's crazy. Yeah, mm-hmm. multiple conventions going on around. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and never could have predicted this. I, I think with, <laughs> yes, I think with the, say yeah, I think yeah. with the fan fiction thing, like, it's kind of not fair if you want to think about it, that you compare yourself to film fic, because... You guys are not fanfic. You guys are a news yeah. aggregator. Mm, exactly, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're, yeah, exactly. We're an aggregate website. We take content and put it all in one place while well, fiction is a dedicated writer's community yeah, that, true. you know, they, they set out to do very different things. Yeah, and like with Finfic, I think with Finfic, it's concentrating 100% on fanfic writing and stuff. I even have a fanfic account and I don't write anything. I just fave stuff and link that so I can read it on my iPad. So wherever I go, I'll have something to read. So I mean... Mm-hmm. To compare it like that is not fair. And with Filmfic, you can post your stuff there, but there's a high chance that nobody will notice it because you're a new writer, there's not much hit. And, well, let's just say that if you want to get noticed, maybe help somebody help you post it out. EQD is a good like place to build do it. Build it up, right? Like, you have got to build up, like, uh, your stories, try your hand at uh, multiple th- things, and uh, eventually, hopefully, you get noticed if it's good enough. Yeah. yeah. It's really tough for, uh... I do not envy new writers nowadays that are trying to get exposure. Like, I think Fim Fiction and Equestria Daily have good... have good user bases and the people that check out the new stories and stuff. But, um... You know, when, when I first started writing, it was so tiny... You know, like, the, the community was so small that there was a good chance that people would just check out, that you would get a whole lot of readers for your story just because it was the new one, the, yeah. the new story. Yeah, and because I everybody's think, been jonesing for that one hit I need to... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I think I got kind of lucky, and then Antipodes got successful, and I just kind of, you know, I was already established. But, yeah, getting noticed nowadays is definitely, you got to work a lot harder than you used to have to. Yep. Right. True, 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 true. We've been, okay, we've been talking about antipodes for quite some time, but up to now, we have yet to know actually what is the story all about. And Yes. Uh, yes, so why don't you give us a little uh, idea of um, what is antipodes? All right, so before I launch into my explanation, I'm going to preface this by saying that antipodes was the first creative writing endeavor that I've really ever undertaken at least the first one that I ever showed to anyone. So, uh... That was was my next question, actually. But yeah, go on. Yeah, oh, okay. Well, (laughs) sorry about the mic, but, um... It was my first one ever, so I feel like I kinda... There's some bits in it that I would change if I could. Uh, Some bits that I'm not super proud of. I still think the story as a whole stands up really well, and it definitely improves dramatically by the end. But, um, at least in my opinion... I'd like to think that it, I got better as I went along. but uh, So yeah, that's just something I'm going to say. But um, Antipodes is 
set in the far future from the show. Uh, too far in the future, if you ask me. If I uh, could go back and do it, I'd probably retcon it to something like 500 years. As it was, I set it to a ridiculously high number of 10,000. But it's set in the far future. And um, it's after a mysterious circumstance uh, caused Celestia and Luna to disappear. And with their disappearance... Uh, the sun and the moon stopped moving around the planet because there was no force to move them. And this was, you know, I started writing it in the middle of season one before Hearth Swarming Eve when, yeah. you know, it was established that all the unicorns can do it if they work together. Yeah. So this is all going, like, the entire story goes off the established canon of halfway through season one. But, uh, so that happened. And, um... Because of that, you know, half the planet started to get really hot because it was continuously baked in the sun, and the other half really cold because it would just, you know, had the moon. Yeah. So uh, the only part that was comfortable was a little band right in the middle in between, and that band was rapidly shrinking. So the ponies from either side uh, waged a war over who got the very small amount of land because there wasn't enough for everybody. And... That war kind of wiped out or greatly diminished whatever small population was left. And uh, a one small group of survivors went into uh, an underground cave network and sealed themselves off from the rest of the planet and the harsh atmosphere outside. And that's where the story starts out. Uh, it's about two ponies that were born and raised in these underground caves maintaining the network of pipes that keeps the water flowing throughout the cave. And through a horrible accident, uh, they get thrust out of the cave and onto the surface where they have to survive out there. Hang on a moment. This is very familiar to a certain video game. Yeah, okay. In my defense, (laughs) I created a lot of questions. (laughs) <laughs> okay, okay. And yes, I realize the Fallout 3 um, similarities are great, uh, but it diverges from there, I promise. But yeah, no, so they get thrust out, and they have to survive out there, and they have to discover the mystery of what happened to Celestia and Luna, and why the sun and the moon stopped, and, you know, what transpired so long ago. All right, that's a very good uh, synopsis there, actually. Actually, I, uh, it sounds like something that I myself would read. Um, I'd say it's more of the fantasy sci-fi genre, isn't it? And, uh, yeah, it's yeah. it's definitely uh, it's an adventure story, very much. Um, oh, it's fantasy. Uh, I I have a weakness for uh, magitech, magical technology, so I work some in there. I kind of set it so, like, when Celestia and Luna disappeared, it was like the future of the show, like 20 years in the future or whatever, and they have pretty advanced technology, but it's all, you know, lost. So anything that they find nowadays is lost technology, and the stuff that they have, they don't really know what how it works. They just sort of keep it going as long as they can. So it's, it's kind of that kind of story. I'd say it leans more heavily towards the fantasy, though. It's more magic than science. All right. Oh, Antipodes. Okay, so that's number one. How about this um, sequel you're working on, um, Lodestone, isn't it? Yes, it is called Lodestone. Um, I gotta, give me a minute here, because I gotta think of a way that I can describe it without mm-hmm. spoiling the ending of Antipodes. Ah, yes, please don't, because I, I might actually read this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, it is set in the future. I'm going to give a very bare-bones summary, because I have to... Uh, do it without spoiling Antipodes. It's right. set after the events of Antipodes. Uh, but but I can't even hear uh, what uh, part two does not require reading Antipodes. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of, um, it's set far enough in the future of Antipodes that all you need to know is the bare basics of what happened, uh, and you can jump right in. Like, if you don't want to read Antipodes, you can just go ahead and jump into Lodestone, because I, I will tell you everything you need to know in the first chapter. It's set in the future of Antipodes, probably about a generation later, mm-hmm. and uh, it follows the story of a young stallion named Spectrum who gets wanderlust and leaves his home community uh, to go on um, an archaeological expedition. And when he gets there, uh, they discover a strange ancient artifact uh, that's unlike anything they've ever seen before, mm-hmm. and... That's about the biggest synopsis that I can give. 
without spoiling anything. <laughs> it's a blue box, isn't it? It's a blue box. Uh, it is not a blue box. I'm sorry. That would be amazing, though. No, oh. but, uh, I, I think I'll actually just sort of quote uh, the last line of the official plot synopsis from fiction, fin fiction here. Uh, what he finds will send him into a head-on collision with forces he can't begin to comprehend, and perhaps a chance to fulfill his destiny. Aha. Uh -huh. And yes, Lodestone is not complete yet, isn't it? No, Lodestone is actually, um, it's on hiatus right now. Here's a little tidbit for all you people out there that might already be fans of me. Uh, thank you. And uh, I think Chapter 3 might be coming really soon. Um, because I've recently been hit by the inspiration bug. So I think um, it's going to be coming along. It'll be coming out of hiatus soon. I'll have some more time to write. But yeah, I wrote the first two chapters. It's about, it's 11,000 words so far, so it's still got a little bit for you to read. But uh, okay. yeah. Okay, uh, I'm just going to read out some stats here from the page from Lodestone. It says here, Journal 1 was uh, written on 7 January this year, 2003, and it's got about 5,600 words. Journal 2 is written uh, in sec 22nd of April. So that's like January, February, March, April. A four-month period between yeah. the first and fourth chapter. <laughs> yeah, I had a rough time in between January <laughs> and April that made writing pretty difficult. And then after April, I just kind of wasn't feeling inspired. And after it went on long enough, I was just like, I should probably put it on hiatus. So I did. But I think, you know, it's all coming back. I'm going to go pick it up soon. So you shouldn't have to wait too long. <laughs> for every chapter, we have to wait four months for the next one. That's like, yeah, really. oh, come the on, story come will on. be finished sometime in 2018. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boys. Oh, talking about all this scheduling, um, how long does it take for you to write a story? Yeah. Uh, it depends on how, you know, A, the fickle inspiration when it hits. That's a big factor of it. Um, I'm sure there's probably a way that I could be better about it because I kind of let, you know, oh, do I feel like writing right now? Uh, not really. I kind of let that dictate my writing schedule a lot more than I should. I should just sort of sit down and do it. But um, when I'm in, a, when I'm like on a roll, I can crank out a chapter once a week. And that was for the first like 17 chapters of Antipodes. I was doing about one a week. And then after that, I slowed down until the end when I was doing one like about once a month. And my, my target is once a month. I like to release a chapter at least once a month. But, uh -huh. you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen. And I'm sure a lot of people face the same problem as well, trying to keep up with the scheduling and being on time to release the chapters. <laughs> yeah, writer's block is a terrible, terrible thing. I just need to be better about forcing myself to write. That's all. Okay, cool. Because I kind of like uh, those writers who post once a month because... It's kind of the anticipation and expectation that you have, like, oh, what is this story? Let me read it. Oh, I enjoy this story. Where is the next one? You yeah. wait, and then the next one comes, oh, it's out. And then the next one comes, it's out. And when you have the expectation, you're, ha you're happy. But when it doesn't come out, like a few fanfics I know, <laughs> um, you'll get really, really um, bummed. And, oh, this, this fic is so long. I wait. Uh, that's it. I'm going to read another one. <laughs> Any idea of, uh, as in, for, for, for Lodestone, have you got the, um, like, you know, the bare bones of uh, what's going to happen next and uh, oh, yeah. kind of ending, all that stuff? I am definitely the kind of writer that plans everything out in advance. Right. Um, I have a fairly clear outline of everything that I want to happen in Lodestone. What I usually do is I will write out the big plot points. I will map all those out in advance. And then I leave myself wiggle room for what I want to happen in between. Like, Antipodes stayed on the rails almost all of the story up until chapter 20-something, at which point I made a major diversion on the spur of the moment that ended up making the story way stronger. But then I went right on back, and the ending is pretty much exactly as it was originally drafted, um, which may or may not be a good thing, depending on if you like the ending or not, but... That's how I usually do it, is I make sure all the big plot points happen when they should and just sort of give myself a little room for improvisation or whatever in between. Oh, it's, well, there you have it. It's uh, quite an interesting tale from a writer of 33 chapters and a total of 
122,000 words <laughs> across uh, nearly how, how, oh yeah, how long did it take for you to complete uh, this thing from start to finish? The, the first it took me a year and a half. Wow. <laughs> that is long. It was a long time. Yeah, I started in March of 2011 and I finished in October of 2012. Wow. <laughs> oh my god. So I just realized that means that the story is over two years old now. <laughs> Ah, I didn't even think of that. Wow, that is crazy. Wait, when let let me see when does when did this pop up on EQD? Because you know there's this thing called um this day in uh this day in pony history, I think. Yeah. It's uh it was in March of twenty eleven. Mm-hmm. I don't remember the exact day. Uh but the post on EQD says October nineteen, two thousand twelve, so Hmm. Well, that that would be the time it was last updated. Uh, but if you, if you read the earliest comment, it's from March of 2012. Oh, really? Now, let's see. March of 2012. Yes. Yeah. The old comment. Or March of 2011. March of 2011. Oh, Serial Sid. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's dated March 13th, 2011. Boom. Yeah, so I guess my. that's the day it went up. March 13th. So, did it went up on this day in history? Hmm. I think it did. Calpin, I'm looking at you. Calpin, Calpin. Yeah. I think he already he he put it in a blast from the past, ah. like one of the first ones. Awesome, right. awesome. I haven't actually looked at the Antipodes post in a long time. This is kind of funny. <laughs> Don't worry. When you update those stone, I'm sure you'll be looking back at it anyway. <laughs> yeah. So I was wondering because um, I see here you only write two stories, and um, do you, have you ever considered about writing a one shot fic? Like, doesn't relate um, to anything else. All the time, but. Here's the problem with me and writing a one-shot fix. I go, I should write a one-shot fic, and then I start to outline it, and then I add more and more details, and then it ends up novel length. And then I go, oh, I should finish the one I'm already writing first. So I'm, I'm just really bad at keeping anything short. And I, I am firmly of the opinion that people that can write short stories are better writers than me because I, I can't do it. Everything I write balloons into epic length. <laughs> oh, man. So I, I all the time think I'll be like, oh, I should write a story, you know, set in the past of how the main characters of Antipodes met, you know, or something like that. Um, and I always have that in the back of my mind. But, you know, whether it ever gets done depends on if I ever manage to pull it off. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Have you ever considered of doing something like um, using the main six as a... Uh story, um, what's the word I'm looking for? As the uh, protagonist. Yeah, as the protagonist for your story. It's just like I, one shot deal, like nothing too serious, like, for example, Twilight like Sparkle reads nice a book. Deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, again, I have considered doing that, but it gives me pause for three reasons. One, I kind of like that I write original characters because I think original characters have a little bit more of a barrier to getting read than stories that have the main six. Like I kind of like that I'm, that I do that uh, and that people care. So that kind of makes me go like, I don't know if I want to write about the main six. I kind of want to write my own characters, but then not that there's anything wrong with writing the main six. But uh, number two is I don't know if I would be good at writing the main six. I've never, I've never done it, you know? So I kind of think like, "Mm, do I want to, it's weird for me to write other people's characters. Mm. It, it's hard for you me don't to... You know until uh, you try. Yeah, it's true. But I just kind of feel like writing other people's characters is a lot more difficult for me than it might be for other people. Mm. And number three is I just haven't had any ideas pop into my head that demanded... That were like, ooh, this would be a great story for the main six. You know, like I don't, I don't really have any ideas going to my head. Like, ooh, what if Twilight did this? You know, for for whatever reason, whenever I think about story ideas, I'm never thinking about like what I want the main six to do. If if that makes any sense. Yeah, I can understand. I can see where you're going. Um, here's a just suggestion for you: write an original character, but in, um, include one of the main six, but use the main mm. six as a background character. Like That's, that would be even harder. <laughs> <laughs> no, because. Uh, Okay, uh, hear me off first. The thing is, you don't write full sentence for the character. Let, let's just say um, you're dealing with Applejack. Like, this guy wants to buy apples from Applejack. And then, like, 
something happened to her, maybe relate with an episode from the show. And maybe um, let's just say that one episode. Um, what was that? Apple Bucking season episode from season one? Apple Buck season number four. Yeah, yeah, Apple Bucks. Oh, that, yeah, I was thinking that would actually be funny if he was trying to buy apples from her during the events of Apple Buck season. Yeah, and then she's, and she's just like completely out of it oh, the whole time. Yeah. She doesn't get right it's by not apples. easy to tie into that thing, right? Yeah, see, that's the, the problem is a lot of people, whenever they hear like, you know, oh, we're mixing OCs in the main six, they immediately just turn off and go like, oh. But I think it's with, that, oh, with that story, story, if you're going to use that one, and with that episode especially, you can go wild with Applejack because Applejack oh, yeah. is not herself. So yeah, here, here's, here's the thing, Norman. Here's yeah? the thing, Norman. That, that actually, I think there's a large base of base of uh, fanfic writers who absolutely have got this peeve whenever the OCs interact with the main. No, main but six. Okay, yeah. the thing is, I'm, I'm not saying that it can't be done well. I'm saying that I don't know if I have the writing chops to do it well. Uh. Well, okay, um, Charlie, with your comment there, it's mm-hmm. the thing is, most people, when they write OCs interacting with the main six, it's always, I am Mr. Um, Sasuke, Sasuke handsome <laughs> guy, emo person who has, uh, who's good looking and have awesome smiles and very emo because something happened and the main six fall in love with this guy. Yeah! Oh. I mean... Oh. It's yeah. always those kind of situations that uh, yeah, makes people turn off with OCs. But or, or, or the Mary Sue situation where, where the author yeah. put themselves in the place of... No, but, but okay, with the story I'm suggesting to PK here is basically, guy wants to buy an apple. <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> guy wants to buy an apple. That, that's, that's, actually, that's actually a really good idea. Like, legit, that's a really good idea for a story. I might... I'm, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it down. I'm going to... Jot that down in my idea book. We'll see if anything ever comes of it. But, uh, I take no credit for it. I just want to read it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, PK, I've got a question regarding Antiquities. Um, it's one of the earlier fanfics and uh, has gotten quite, quite a good amount of coverage. I'm looking at like um, a number of fan art here. So mm-hmm. is this like one of the first stories to ever get um, fan feedback from a fan fiction? Like fan content out of a fan piece of work? Oh, no, it, it's definitely not the first. There were stories before that were getting fan art and stuff drawn of it. Um, I think the reason Antipodes got as popular as it did is probably, I think, just due to good timing. Mm. Uh, it came out, there were no, like back then, there were no big adventure fix. You know, like this was before Fallout Equestria. Yeah. Everyone was writing Slice of Life. And then I came along with this big epic adventure story and everyone was like whoa we haven't seen this before so i think if it came out now like if i released it now it Mm -hmm. wouldn't get nearly as popular as it did but i think also another thing that really helped out the story i think is a mad max csi Uh, CSI mad max yeah csi mad max all right she became a fan really early on and drew me an amazing cover image and everyone went, whoa, you know, this story has Mad Max art as its cover. And uh, everyone went into it, and then that kind of spiraled out from there. Uh, I will say that probably my favorite thing that has come out of writing Antipodes is the fan art. It's it's just, it's amazing, you know, that, that people care that much about the story to sit down and make these great pieces yeah. of art about it. It's it's incredible. It's more than I could have ever asked for. <laughs> it's a great feeling. Uh, it is. W- would you like to like provide us with some links so that we can uh, share it in show notes for uh, the rest of the viewers? Yeah, sure. Let me have my DeviantArt open here. I can just okay. grab a couple of my favorite. Oh, you have a DeviantArt. I didn't know that. I do. I'll post it after I get all yeah, these sure, links no problem. together. We'll, we'll include it in the show notes so that everyone can have, can have a look at it in the link yeah. section. All right. Okay, so uh, another question I have regarding this. Um, do they, does Antipodes have got um, side stories written out of it? Like, uh, I remember Fallout Equestria or My Little Dashi, some people have written smaller stories out of it. Now, you said yourself that you didn't write any short stories uh, regarding the, the history of perhaps this character and so forth. But has other mm-hmm. people actually done, done There's only one side story that I know of that was done. And I that's one thing I kind of wish. Like, and uh, I wish there had been more side stories. Like, I wish it had spawned this Fallout Equestria-style universe. But, yeah, it didn't quite, for whatever reason. 
it didn't get that many side stories. And, uh, oh, there's one thing I should actually mention. Um, while it didn't get that many side stories, there is this just amazingly talented guy on YouTube named uh, Mindcog, whose link I will post right now. He is an artist and a musician, and he is actually creating a soundtrack for Antipodes, and it is amazing. It is so, it is stunning. The music is incredible, and the art is gorgeous for it, and I would highly, highly recommend that everyone check out his stuff, because it's so good. Uh, I can't praise it enough. You got an entire soundtrack here, a whole playlist of soundtrack dedicated to the fanfic. Cool. And there's there's at least 12 tracks there. All right, yeah. cool. That's very good. So it has spawned its own, deri- de- its own derivative, but just not in the same way in fiction. But yeah, not not. It spawned a lot of fan art. A lot of fan art. If you search, uh, Incendia, Incendia is one of the characters in the story, and she is far and away the fan favorite. If if you search Incendia on Derby Buru, there's something like 70 pictures. I like can see why. Them, yeah, like most of them are reaction images and stuff, but uh, there's still 70 of them, and it's it's really great. And um, so it's it spawned a lot of those. It spawned you know this incredible music, and uh, not so much fiction. I wish there was more fiction. If anyone out there reads the story and wants to write a uh, side story, I will love you forever. But um, do it. There was in development an adventure game. Like, someone was making a game, but it, as these projects often do, it fizzled out and didn't end up going anywhere. Yeah, uh, that's a shame. But, that's a shame. Well, so you, know, you know about these projects, anyway. Some some really take off to, to great levels, and others just, you know, they don't materialize, mainly due to the creator not having enough, uh, not having enough time to complete their works of creativity. All right, uh, so I think we're done with the uh, fan fiction and EQD part, uh, unless Norman has got something to ask regarding these two topics. Mm, well, on EQD, like I was wondering, uh, how well do you guys know each other? Like the whole ah, crew, the, yes. like the main crew, like uh, Seth, Serial, Calpain, and V, and v. Mm, yeah, V. And don't forget Zyro. Yeah, so um, like how how well do you guys know each other, or is there more beyond that? We we all know each other really well. We talk, you know, all the time. We're all really good friends. Oh. Uh, you guys game together? Uh, not okay. weirdly, not that much. Well, maybe it's just me because I don't play a lot of multiplayer games. <laughs> but I know Fee is really big into League of Legends, and Seth is into everything. <laughs> so oh, yeah. I particularly like it when Fee actually posts a review of an old obscure or indie game and. When I get to see it for the first time, it's in mm-hmm. pony form, yes. But then I always go yeah. back to the original concept and say, whoa, how did I miss this game? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a great feeling. Yeah, Fee had, at one time, she had a huge, like, antique game collection. It was really neat. Oh. Huge what game? Antique game? Antique. Uh, antique. Antique, right. Like, yeah, just, like, old games from, like, the 80s. And, yes. You know, like, like uh, and. and NES games and stuff like that. NES, NES, maybe a Genesis. <laughs> Who yes. plays the Genesis? I support, I support. I love those old games. They're, they're very, they have the kind of like a nostalgic feeling to it when you play them, you know? Indeed, indeed. All right. Okay, so now that we're done with the main questions, uh, I've got some itty bitty questions for you, if you don't mind answering. I have noticed that you've actually organized the meetup before this and mm-hmm. posted it on Equestria Daily. So would you like to tell me more, a little bit about this meetup? Well, that meetup, uh, first of all, it spawned a really infamous picture. (laughs) Um, If you've ever seen uh, Friendship is Witchcraft, uh, yeah, the the face that appears on Apple Bloom's flank, who's that pretty lady? Uh, That guy was at the meetup. Um, Oh. Yeah. Uh, It was was not me. I want to say that right now. But uh, he was there. So I should tell you something. But, um, no, that was, I believe, I might be wrong, and if I am, I know I will hear about it, but uh, I believe it was the first organized, large-scale brony meetup ever. Mm-hmm. Um, it was definitely the first meetup group on meetup.com, uh, followed, I believe, like a day or two later by the New York group, and the New York group became BronyCon. 
Mm-hmm. Um, oh, yeah. Just, yeah, for the record. So it was definitely a historic event at any rate. And it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I lost track with the meetup group later just because it cost too much for me to maintain. You have to pay to keep a meetup account. Yeah. Uh, so I, I transferred control of it to someone else, and then after a while I just sort of lost track. But, yeah, that's basically what happened there. Actually, I have to stray a little bit off topic here. I realized meetup.com actually costs real money to maintain and stuff. I, I Basically, I don't understand how does this concept work. I mean, shouldn't be organizing meetups be free of charge? Yeah, you'd think so, but no. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what privileges do you get out of that website? I, I guess they're just choosing instead of like an ad-supported mm. uh, model, they're choosing like you, you pay... And you get all these features with no ads and everything. I don't know. I'm. It's dumb. I don't use it <laughs> anymore. All right. Okay. So that's the first mission in this question I would like to ask. Uh, next, I would like to ask. Uh, is, just give me a moment. I'm a little bit derpy right now. Um, ah, yes. Have you ever been to any major conventions before this? Uh, be- before when? Before Pony? Um, as in... Oh, sorry, you haven't? You mean, as in currently, up to now? BronyCon, remember? Oh, yeah, I went to the BronyCon last year. I went to Everfree Northwest last year. I went to Cantalot Gardens last ah, year. But um, this, this year? This year, the only con I went to, this is very sad, but the only con I went to this year was Unicon. <laughs> and we all know how Unicon turned out. And then oh. I was supposed to go to Everfree Northwest because it's right... It's, it's really close to me, but I couldn't get time off work, so I had to miss it, and that was awful. And then I can't afford to go to BronyCon, so I'm going to miss that. So it looks like I might not be going to any other ones this year. Uh, well, have you tried about Nightmare Night Dallas? I I would really like to go to Nightmare Night Dallas, but I just don't know if I'm going to have the money, you know? Like, it's, it's just a lot of money to travel around the U.S., and I don't know if I'm going to have... It, because I'm going to be starting school, and I have to have uh, orthodontic work done. It's all, you wow. know, it takes away a lot of money. So oh, okay, understandable. I'd like to, but we'll see. We'll see. Understandable. Yeah. Understandable. Big bang is running dry and stuff. Actually, <laughs> okay. So, would you? Is, is there any um, memorable experience you'd like to share with us from your past cons? You've, been, you've already been to like three cons. Uh, all right. Here's a good story. Oh, yeah. um, this was the time when I was, I was BronyCon. Uh, I'd known, I've talked to JJ, John Josego, oh, yeah, uh, online right. a lot before before this, but I wanted to meet him in person, so his booth is always super crowded. So I was there standing, waiting in line to get into his booth, and my back is turned, like the signing area was behind me. <laughs> my back was turned to it. So I'm standing there in line waiting to get up to JJ's booth, and uh-huh. these two security guys, uh, uh-huh. these two big big security guys come walking right by me and stop like immediately behind me. And I'm like, well, what's going on? And I turn around, and standing directly behind me is Lauren Faust. Oh. And um, then the security guys immediately begin to lead her away. And I just like weakly raised up a hand and was like, hey, oh. <laughs> and she got let out of the building, and I never saw her again. For the rest of the convention, I never got to meet Lauren Faust. Whoa! And I am. I was so sad. That was my one chance. I was. She was there. She was there for like a good ten or fifteen minutes. Oh god! I was standing right next to her, and I didn't look around to see. Oh. And I could have talked to her, and I never. I to this day, I've never been able to get a hold of her. Oh so, man, it's like a missed chance. <laughs> I know it was, um, it was it was awful, um, but that happened. Wow. Besides oh. that, we have all the craziness that went on at Unicon. I don't know how good of a story that would make, though. It was uh, the best part was when we decided, you know, the con wasn't very much fun, so we were going to go hit the strip. <laughs> and then while we were out on the strip, they called us out. And they were, they called us up and were like, "Dude, they're kicking people out of hotel rooms. You got to get back." And we all had to pile into a taxi and like floor it back to the Riviera. Oh wow. god! I I heard that. Um, I I don't know who. I mean, maybe it was Apple Cider. Yeah, it was Apple Cider that decided. Oh, is it? Um, who? I, I think I, I'm I'm remembering it wrong, but I think it's Apple Cider who uh, came up with the idea of 
um, all the major news networks go out and ask for help to do something. Yeah, that was Cider. He was there when things got serious, like when it, when we we all were at a party and the news broke all at once that of what was going down. You know that the con had run out of money, that the con had said, you know, skip town or whatever, just vanished off the face of the earth. And uh, Apple Cider, he he took control. He got a plan together. And um, he organized everyone in that room when we were all kind of panicking. And he really, like, he was completely on point that day. You know, major respect for what he did and what everyone did there. You know, I'm really proud of how everyone came together and helped, you know, bail everyone out of Unicorn. Yeah. That, that is actually, I think, uh, one of the hot uh, touching parts of the, uh, the, the fandom. Even though the con actually blew up and uh, it was a mess, the recovery phase was actually... Uh, good and a lot of people showed uh, kindness and support eventually yeah. bringing to a better conclusion than, than it would have been without them it was pretty incredible especially afterwards when we were all organizing ways for everyone who got screwed over by the hotel to uh, yeah. get their money back um, and I'm just amazed that everyone did this goes to show that for such a young fandom we actually have quite big hearts yeah it's true we have really good uh just a really generous community. It's everyone is so kind and uh, so willing to help out other people when they're in need. It's really heartwarming. True, okay. true. Norman, you want to have us? I think I think I've got covered most of the questions. Well, Norman, okay. Well, can... here's a favorite question of mine that I like to ask from the guests. So you said that you enjoy playing single player games. So, what games do you play? I play a lot of uh, Western RPGs. Yeah. Um, which are like games like uh, Skyrim is probably the one that most people would know. Uh, lately, I've been playing uh, Dragon Age Origins because it went on sale on Steam. Oh, and I awesome. haven't played. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I need to I need to buy that one, man. I remember enjoying the game so much. I really like uh, Fallout. Fallout's great. Um, all the Fallout games, pretty much. I like Very all. Good of them. You yeah, even, even take uh, the older ones. The the even, even the older ones. Too. Yeah, there are very different in like uh, experience than the modern games I don't think one is better than the other I think they appeal to different audiences yeah but because you know I mean the the old ones are a product of their time and they're really great yeah, you know I role-playing know. games but yeah so the, the, that's the kind of games that I play a lot a lot of uh, RPGs mm-hmm. Mass Effect as well so yeah I love Mass Effect Mass Effect is one of my favorites oh, okay so you play most of your games on the PC then yeah, I'm a big PC gamer. Oh, okay. Oh. Well, I just recently finished Final Fantasy XIII and I got no idea what happened. <laughs> Neither does anyone else. I don't know. The ending was really abrupt and like, okay, here's what's happening. So, okay. What's going on? Mind telling me, game? Game. What's going on? Was it really that confusing? Well, see, that's because Final Fantasy XIII is less of a game and more of a hallway simulator. True indeed, but it's a fun hallway simulator. It's a fun one. But uh, besides the Western RPGs, do, do you tend to play any um, multiplayer games? Like, let's say Half Life. Half wow, Half Life. What am I talking about? I was about to say Half Life's not multiplayer. There, there is, there is a multiplayer for Half Life. Well, there's Deathmatch, but yeah. But no, um, the one I was thinking about is Team Fortress. Yes, Team Fortress Two. Uh, a little bit. I let's check my Steam and see what my hours are to give you an idea of how little amount. Yeah, like two hours I've played since wow. 2007. Wow. So not very much. That was uh, I'm just really them. like, I don't know. I think I lack the competitive gene. I just don't really uh, have a lot of fun doing them. And also I'm terrible at them. So, oh, you know. okay. So you tend to play mostly with yourself and... <laughs> Is that the, don't take it that way, you dirty-minded doctor, you. Sorry, it's a reaction. It's a reactionary thing. Oh, you doctor. <laughs> uh, but you play single-player. kind of single-player game. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but no, I play a lot of, yeah, mostly single-player games. Yeah. yeah. I think uh-huh. most of the um, older generation games, we, we start started with single player games because at that time multiplayer wasn't that uh, up and happening at the moment we had very dopey mm-hmm. internet connection there, there weren't a lot of other kids my age in my neighborhood so I mostly only had access to single player games 
Mm, yeah, I see. I, I still know. remember the last time when we used to play on the dial up modem. We would hog up the um, telephone lines. <laughs> Nobody could call in when we played our multiplayer games. And that, that was a long night. Back in 1995, my dad used to play Doom 2 over dial-up with a guy once <laughs> oh, in a year. Wow. wow. Yeah. That, that's old school retro, yo. Yeah. On floppy disks. Oh, God, floppy disks. Yeah, yes. Floppy. Uh, talking about old school, I remember transferring a, um, a 2 megabyte, no, a 2, what was the standard? Like, 1 gig file? or huh? For what? Song, MP3s back then. I, I think MP3s, it's, no, not gig. They, about... Um, Three megabyte, maybe. Yeah, I think so. It's it's something like that. Like maybe one hundred megabyte. I don't know. But back then, I w- I used like four to five or six floppy disks to get one song. Yeah. Wow. Those yeah. those were insane. Probably ten megabyte because it can't be hundred. Hundred is huge, man. Yeah, hundred hundred back then is huge. That would be like that would be like eighty floppy disks because floppy disks are like one point four four megabytes. Yeah, maybe ten. I I don't know. I got no idea. But all I remember was floppy disk in zip. Oh, floppy disk full change. Okay, there you go. You guys and, remember the the smaller ones, the compact floppy disks, or the big ones? The the, the compact one, uh, the big size the, one. The, yeah, the the big ones were a little before my time. Yeah. yeah. The standard one. But I I definitely used the small ones. I had all my computer games when I was a little little tiny child. Oh. Uh, little PK then. I thought you were going to say Philly. <laughs> <laughs> when I was chilly. Yeah. Hey PK, um, here's a random question. Have you played Ultima? I have not, but I know a lot about it. Ah. Uh, is it Ultima online? Not online. It's Ultima. Uh, just basically Ultima because I remember Ultima Nine. Not Ultima Nine. I think Ultima Seven something like that. They use the, still use floppy disks before CD-ROMs were in, oh. invented. Oh, anybody could afford CD-ROMs. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and boy, that game sucks. All right. Okay, Norman, do you want to wrap up before we move on to more random questions? No, I think um, video game chat has been done. Like, we all know PK likes to play with himself. <laughs> Single-player games. Single-player games. I know, that was intentional. Oh, school. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Play it like it was how it was meant to be. So anyway, I I'm done. I'm done. I I, w- I won't go for the um, solo jokes again. That's bad of me. <laughs> All right. So our next section would be shoutouts, right? Indeed. But before that, PK, thanks for coming on and thanks for talking to us and sharing your stories. Hey, no problem. It was fun. Yeah. Thank you very much, PK. We certainly learned a lot from this um, interview session. Well, it's good to hear. I think once I uh, hang up here, I'm probably just going to immediately turn around and flop right into bed. <laughs> okay, 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 okay. okay. Anyway, um, you're always welcome to come on again. And don't be shy. Just give us a holler and say, hey, I want to be on. Can I? Please. I won't, I won't disturb you. I'll be in the closet. You can say that. And, well, why not? You can be in the closet. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, All right. All right, shout-out section. Indeed. I will take the first one. Um, I guess my shout-out would have to go to you, PK. Well, thanks thanks a lot for, for coming on. Actually, I know that we've been trying to schedule the correct timing, and of all days, it has got to be on, on such a tiring day. Thank you so, so much for actually being able to uh, do this for us. We, I really appreciate it. It's no problem. Okay, so Norman, do you have a shout-out? I do, and well, like you, it's to PK. Thanks for coming on and well, having this small talk with us because it's fun. Like you taught me a lot about writing and stories from Unicorn and BronyCon. And funny thing is, uh, talking about BronyCon, I think JJ got to see Lauren Faust. He did. Yeah. Yeah. So like. How? I was, I was the only one of my friends that didn't get to see her. Like, everyone else got to see her. Oh, God. I I, uh, I, I know the feeling. Left alone with... I, uh, I remember. I, I'm quite sure it was an EQD a roundup or something. The BronyCon roundup. And they had um, uh, JJ and Lauren Faust uh, together um, with shaking hands or something like that. And I remember one of the funniest top comments was... Does she know that he's the guy that actually wrote that blog? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was so true, but <laughs> I, I, I don't. I don't. Sorry, here's the thing. I, I don't even think that JJ wants to mention uh, Princess Molestia blog. I, I think she doesn't know. No, I mean, and I think it's best it kept that way. Yeah. Is uh, it? I don't know. I I I think she probably knows, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. 
decide to listen to all this. Uh, you guys are awesome. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my friend Alex. And I think that's about it. Okay, all right. Okie dokie dokie then. So, if you have any questions, concerns, or suggestions for the show, you can contact us at mbsshow at gmail.com. And if you would like to email us personally, you can also, well, well, you can reach me at norman at mbsshow.com, daniel at daniel at mbsshow.com mbsshow.com and charlie is charlie at the mbsshow.com yeah that's right it still exists oh kilo kilo ki then and also you can reach us on twitter the show's twitter account is at the mbs show that's for show news what's happening with the host and so on and you can reach me at norman at twitter something like that i don't really remember because i'm derpy right now over there you can get news from me what i'm playing what i'm eating what Toys, do I have something new? And just my interaction with bronies. And Charlie, you're yes, at Charlie... Yes, I, I do have a Twitter as well, which uh, hardly updates, but maybe I'll update a little bit more in the future. Uh, it's at, at BRCXY, at, no, at Twitter, right? <laughs> it's hard, right? It's hard, right, after reading emails? Uh, <laughs> yes, I would say so. <laughs> Indeed. So, um, PK, you have a Twitter, right? I do. It is at PK underscore EQD. Okie dokie dokie. So what can people expect from you? My Twitter is mostly uh, just me talking about stuff that is going on moment to moment and having conversations with people. Um, it's a lot It's it's a lot real, more real life focused than most of my stuff. Oh, um, cool. So yeah, it's mostly just me talking about what's going on in my life. Okie dokie dokie. It sounds... Well, uh, I think we need to follow you because if it's day-to-day life, stalkers, be ready! <laughs> <laughs> and also, please subscribe and read us. You have on. a as I as we have heard. Yeah, but my DeviantArt's kind of abandoned. Like, I don't upload anything to it anymore. I just kind of use it to favorite art. Uh, but if you want it, it's pk-13-12.deviantart.com. And links oh. will be provided in the show notes. Indeed. Do you have any other links like um, DeviantArt, YouTube, or anything? <laughs> because uh, I have my Fim Fiction account okay. where you can find all my stories and stuff. All right. And that is going to be... It's just fimfiction.net slash user slash pk. Wow. I have to say, that is one of the most amazing names I've ever seen. <laughs> it's simple. <laughs> it's it's PK, like, it's so clean. Easy to remember. <laughs> Indeed, PK. And also please subscribe and rate us on iTunes and Stitcher Radio and also like our Facebook page. Links will be provided in the show notes. So I have been Norman Sanzo. I have been Charlie. PK. I, think that was your key. I am PK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous! Anyway, we'll see you guys on the next special episode. Bye. Bye, guys. Goodbye.
right. So hmm, my next follow-up question is: When you've gone to the cons, uh, so what what interesting stuff have you picked up from there? Or what is the most interesting stuff that you've picked up from there? The most interesting thing. Uh, a sign for t- a sign picture or something like that. Let's see. I'm gonna open up my pony swag drawer, which is right in front of me, <laughs> and swag. through all my stuff. No, who signed this? <laughs> oh, this is a signature in Daedric. That's why I didn't understand it at first. Okay, probably the most interesting thing that I picked up is not a physical object, but it is a picture of Pixel Kitties using a Lyra plushie with a hole in her backside. Oh, like <laughs> she has it. <laughs> really, she has it. Yes. Oh, no, she has two. She uses them as slippers. You mean, oh. Yeah. Hold on, I have this picture on my Twitter. I will link it. You mean, like, the human pixel kitties or the... the human pixel kitties. Oh. The real-life pixel. She has it? She has it, yes. The next time I talk to her, I want to talk about... Oh, my, you broke me. You got me there. I mean, I knew it exists. But uh, I don't think she publicly posted that any picture of that. She she did make a funny drawing on it on her on her DA, but getting the actual oh my okay okay. Wow, <laughs> I did.